All right, so let's get this show on the road. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us for Smart Water Wednesdays. We are back, we are live. Uh, I am excited to have you. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. We have uh, not had a live session in a while. It has been training season, so I was lucky enough to see many of your faces live and in person, many of your faces uh, still via webinar, but we are working on getting face-to-face -face soon. So uh, thank you to all of you who played along this spring. Um, and we are back with a whole slate of new Smart Water Wednesday. Um, excited, excited, excited to, to have you here today. And to start off, ooh, I'm going to share my screen real fast. Uh, start off with a series this season. We'll start season three off with a series we're going to call Drought in the West. Um, as I talk to water managers day in and day out, this is on the top of everyone's mind. Uh, and I think this is the biggest subject in water management today. There is no bigger challenge that we face and no real, um, no real better justification than smart or than drought to justify smart controllers and to upgrade your system and, and really keep a very close eye on that water because it is precious and it is in high demand. So uh, I have with me today my friend Andrew Chase, who is an industry leader, a titan of the irrigation industry, um, and a friend of mine and a friend of the show. So we've seen him on a couple of episodes. As you see on the screen, he was also part of my guinea pig uh, drop episode. So he was on the very first episode of the game show we did last season called Dropped. Um, let me stop sharing and show your face. Hello, Andrew Chase. Hey, Ben, how's it going? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Good. It's Thanks for making time for us this morning. Oh, no. Any time for the for for the for the show. This is this is what we're looking for these days is, is to get get the word out. Right. Make more people pumped, as pumped as you for 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 getting getting it done the right <laughs> way and try to help everybody do do all of this stuff. Amen to that. Uh, definitely want to collect all of our water nerds into one bunch and, and give them good uh, water management information. Make sure that we're just talking about the things that are important to the water managers out there. Um, and so we've got a great example today. So what we are going to delve into, let me start sharing again. Now I've got some slideware to emphasize this. Um, what we want to talk about today is the drought. And um, it used to be we talk about drought and it would come and it would go. And it seems to me that looking at the U.S. drought monitor really tells the whole story about kind of where we are in terms of drought and, and moving forward. Andrew, when you look at this, what do you see? I, I just see the, the whole Western United States in trouble. I mean, you know, before we would have pockets here and there, but right now it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's bad. All, it's bad all over. It, it, everybody needs to you know, start, you know, lending a hand into helping, helping all of us uh, save as much water as we can to, to share it with us. You know, I know that there's a lot of uh, legislation everywhere, but in the, in the end, you know, it's, this is our breadbasket. You know, we're we're gonna lose, you know, from ag to to, to landscape. We we need to save every drop we can and make it the most efficiently used as possible. Uh, Absolutely, it's, it's, it's pretty scary to see that much red in the beginning of April. Yeah, that, that was what I was gonna mention. Is here we are at the very beginning of our irrigation season, right? Like this is the end of the wet season and the beginning of the dry season, and still the drought map is lit up like a Christmas tree. My entire state is engulfed. Yours has extreme drought in places. Um, <clears throat> do you lit? Do you, more importantly, do your customers listen to this information, and and do you see it in the marketplace catching awareness? Um, I see it in the marketplace. My customers um, get fed this every month when we do our, our water reports for, for our sites. Um, I put in, not only do I put in the drought monitor status for, for, well, you know, for us, we just do California. They don't really look outside of California, but we will do the drought monitor status um, as of the latest report uh, when we file that report. And then I also uh, download um, the National Weather Service's three to four week outlook. 
uh, for precipitation and uh, temperature, which every every time I do it, it's below average precipitation, above average temperatures for the next four weeks, just to let them know, hey, you know, we're 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 doing our best with the water that we have. So couple of things to build on right there. So uh, one thing that you mentioned that I, I want to kind of highlight is what's going on in California, right? Like it is a big deal everywhere. Don't get me wrong. But California has a lot of headlines that I feel like we need to be paying attention to. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing as a mandate from the governor? Yeah, the, 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 the governor's executive order slash mandate for the water districts to 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 f- figure out how to you know how to how to reduce our water consumption fifteen to twenty percent, um, and that budget target is for twenty twenty uh, baseline. So, a few years ago when, when when we when we had our last long long drought, you know we our baseline was a, a much higher number. Um, this time around, you know the governor is using a twenty twenty number where we've already started implementing smart technology for years in a lot of our sites. And so now that number is a a much smaller number to hit versus last time. And that's a great point, right? Because we've seen droughts come and go. We've used that as an impetus to invest in irrigation systems and and smart technology. We've already made a lot of progress. So what you're doing, the sites that you're on specifically, are pretty close to running exactly the irrigation that they need to keep their plant life healthy. Uh, to make any further cuts at this point is, is, is gonna be felt. Can you talk about what you see as a potential backlash as to what you see with making these cuts? Yeah, and, and you know, that goes to you know, following the water budget. You know, it, here in Southern California, we're giving a, a monthly budget based off of weather and, and they, they use ET and then they give us, you know, a crop factor of 0.7 for uh, potable water and 0.8 for recycled water. And so during the billing cycle, whatever ET was for that, for, for that month, you know, they, they give us a sliding scale of how much water we can use. Well, April, we're rolling into April, April, 2020 was an extremely wet month for us. We actually had 300 to 400% uh, above average rainfall. And if we're being asked to cut 20% on that, where our water budgets are 57% above that this time of year, and that's the the water districts, it's extremely difficult. So that's the, that's the game that we're having to play. And, you know, we, we, we mentioned that, you know, we're just doing the best we can to keep our landscapes alive at this point, but that, that 20% number, isn't isn't a target we can realistically hit just because we don't have the rain and so now we have to tell our customers well you know we're gonna we're gonna water to the best of the landscape but we are gonna cut back and you're gonna see some stre- uh, stress plants this month and that's what i think is important for the water nerds to be able to not only hear but convey in their conversations is uh, if we're doing it right already and we make cuts, there will be a visible effect in the landscape and we have to do what we need to do to protect the investment, right? We have millions of dollars in these landscapes. I can dry it out, sure, and it will still remain alive, Uh, but there is a point at which just maintaining landscape health is is a struggle, right? And, And there will be a cost in the appearance of the landscape. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and that's, and, and the first thing we tell our customers is, you don't need that turf. You know, all, all it is is all it is is to keep the dog walkers happy. It's not functional turf, and that's the big part of that that order is is functional turf might go away, especially if you're watering it with potable water. Um, I estimate that I oversee about a, a million square feet of turf that's watered with potable water that's non-functional, and you know we have great rebates as incentives for that. But um, you know one of the one of the key drivers of turf grass is that it's a, uh, people are, uh, around here especially are very sentimental towards the turf grass and they see the turf grass go, they go, we don't want it to look like the desert. Well, there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't make it look like the desert that uses less water. Right. And now's the time that we really need to start. 
thinking about that. But what I see from my perspective is this is an escalation, right? Now we're going from just incentivizing the, the smart controllers to limiting the turf grass, something that we've seen precedent in in Vegas and other places. But now when your governor starts talking about it, that is, that's huge news. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, every, every state has its own issues and, 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 you know, they, they're managing it to the best they can, but it just seems like California is the bellwether, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, there are states that enacted pressure regulating sprinkler heads before us, but when California did it now, it's a, it's a big, it's a big deal. Now Colorado does it <laughs> only yeah. after California tips their or yeah. dips their toe in the water. But, right. But, but like for, I think Vermont was the first uh, state to do it. Right. They, and, and it's, it's, it's things like that, that make California, you know, we have 10% of the, the country's population that lives here and it affects us all. And uh, absolutely. But it's not just California, right? That's kind of the, the underlying message is that if I look at YouTube, I see all sorts of gloom and doom conversation about this drought. We see uh, the, the, just the top four YouTube items that come up on my search talk about the worst drought in a thousand years. It talks about uh, how this will have ripple effects for years to come in both agriculture and commercial and residential landscapes. Uh, and we talk about this drought crisis that you see at the bottom of the screen is from Denver 7, right? This is my neck of the woods. This is in California talking about a mega drought, which is the, if you read the article talking about the worst drought conditions our country has ever faced, um, including the Dust Bowl. So, I mean, it is not not a joke. Like this is <laughs> this is something that we need to take very seriously, especially as water managers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our water bank, which is you know for us this year in Nevada, is we're we're at thirty percent of normal starting April. You know, it's 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 historically low. I know your neck of the woods. You didn't even get snow until mid December, no. which never happens. Right. It's, it's the change is happening, and the change is re very real now. So we don't uh, need to say any more about how the drought is a real thing, right? I. I fail to believe that anyone watching uh, questions us on that. So what I want to focus on today in our drought in the West special is what drought looks like for water management, specifically for you. I want you to be the voice of our contractor crowd, our water nerd, our irrigation guys out in the field. What is it that uh, we see <clears throat> the drought causing in the daily life or the workflow of these guys? Um, and, or you want to, do you have something before oh, I start? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So, That's what we're going to start off with. So, um, the one thing that I see across the board is limiting when you run your irrigation system. Can you give me some context around how this, this limitation works? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, across, across our area, you know, last go around with the drought, they definitely made it pretty pretty heavy handed in the in the middle of it where it was some some water districts were one day a week for 10 minutes only and um this go around so far um when we speak to the water purveyors um if we're if they're on a not already on a tiered rate schedule if it's still a single single rate pay they are definitely enacting the, these uh you know limiting irrigation days i have one site where they say Right now, it's two days per week, uh, and it's Monday, Friday. Okay, so I have controllers that are 42, 48 stations. I have, you know, tw a site with 28 controllers on there, and in, in this site is pretty green. It's pretty lush, and one of the ways that we, we talk, we make these relationships with our water purveyors, and I think it's is key, is, is we tell them, look, you want a two-day-per-week water cycle. I can give you a two day per week water cycle, but how about I split my zones so I can run longer because my water, what you're giving me a water window of, you know, like 5 PM to 8 AM. So we're not watering during the, during daylight hours. Okay. Well, what if I split my zones and I still only water two, two per week or, but I split some Monday, Friday, some Tuesday, Saturday, some Sunday, Thursday, and 
I'll open up my controller programming. I'll show you everything there is in it. You can audit it whenever you want. But that way I can, I can open up my water window uh, runtimes and allow for longer watering and still keep my landscape healthy. And most, and, of, and, most, and most of our material is drought tolerant. So sometimes it wasn't even watering that week. It was waiting a week, you know, week to 10 days. And so it hit and water, you know, less than once a week. And so in, in actuality, we're saving more water doing it that way than trying to shove as much water as we can on the plant material and the plant material is happier for it. So when you talk to your uh, agency friends, which we'll feature next week, or not next week, next session, um, we will talk to the agency. But when you talk to them about um, kind of the, the realistic water restrictions that you see to get the water down that you need, what is their response? Uh, how is that received? It's if, if as long as we can make a good case point for it, it's generally well received. Uh, my, my case point was a strain on the infrastructure. If everybody waters on Monday and Friday, how much of a drawdown are we going to have on the system during that time period where everybody's trying to do it? So I go, so if I water off, off that schedule, you know, I'll have a little, little, you know, the, the infrastructure won't be a strain with everybody trying to do it all at once. So they're and, receptive to it. Yeah, they were very receptive to it. And so far we haven't had, you know, we have had, I think them ask once. And I gave them the, our programming sheet work and I said, here it is. Um, you can see my past, uh, you know, 30 days run schedule. I could put it back to 60 days and, and, and you can see twice a week, you know, every nice. seven days, we've only been one or two run times. And they're like, okay, great. Thanks. You know? So uh, limiting the, the available irrigation days and times is something that I see across the board. This is a, a, not a new water restriction. It's something that we see in our market uh, as a volunteer program every year. Uh, but this is by far the most common restriction that we see. Now, what yeah. I, I'm starting to see in California and uh, what I haven't seen before is them asking to limit the amount of water you're putting down per station. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, and this goes back to the, um, to the, to the previous droughts where they just say, Hey, it's a 10 day, it's a 10 minute uh, runtime. They're still under the perception that we're still using um, spray heads and, and bubblers uh, to uh, inefficiently water uh, plant material. So that, again, that comes back to having that relationship with your water purveyor and say, look, our, my community has invested in drip irrigation. It has invested in low flow, uh, high efficiency nozzles. I can't put down enough water to keep anything alive in 10 minutes. 10 minutes on an MP rotator doesn't even make a dent. Yeah, no, it, it, you know, at four tenths of an inch per hour and you've got 10 minutes, you, you know, the, it, everything's going to cook. Right. And you know, a lot of our drip is, is also that low, you know, four tenths to six tenths of an inch per hour. I mean, we have areas where it's higher flow, but in general with our clay soils, that's what it is. And um, so again, having that relationship and saying we have high efficiency, high efficiency drip irrigation, we, we have high efficiency nozzles. Can we, can we open it up if it's tied to a, a smart controller? Can we open it up? And again, they're generally receptive to it. And then their biggest concern is, just make sure we don't see any water flowing down the street in any, any runoff. Because Amen to that. Runoff, and that's right? part of, any water that's in part the water is that. It's it. like, if there's runoff whatsoever, we're done. And so that 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 means that our, our company's irrigation uh, team is really on the hook to make sure that they their uh, their maintenance inspections are performed at, at a much uh, greater interval and a much more detailed interval, making sure everything's adjusted off the curb instead of, you know, right at the curb line, you know, kick it, kick it forward a little bit. Nice. We'll, we'll, we'll brown out some turf on a curb or on a sidewalk to, to not have any, anything there. But, you know, we're, we're a lot of our sites already uh, taking uh, curb off of the uh, turf off the curb strips. Cool. So that way we don't have to worry about that. So nice. that's, that's the big one. The one thing that I've seen that I wanted you to quickly touch base on is an initiative that says, turn down all of your irrigation by 10%, right? By a certain percentage. Um, and I'll show you that. We're going to do a demo of, of these features as the tech nerd stuff pay off a, a little bit later. Um, but can are you seeing that in your districts at all? We haven't been asked that yet. 
Um, we haven't been asked just to do a mandatory 10% cut. Um, the, a lot of what we're a lot of what we're seeing is more in just the, the they're just they're just controlling more of the days per week right now. Okay. So awesome. Yeah. All right. Back to my back to my screen here. We'll go. Uh, next thing that I see your illustrious governor talking about is uh, responding like real time management style to um, in this case weather events. The the ask is that. Um, no irrigation run two days after rain. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing for that? Um, there's there's two ways we're doing that. Number one is uh, if if we got a solid chance of rain and that's pretty much maybe fifty percent or higher, you know we're going ahead and doing a rain shutdown uh, one to two days out. Uh, number one, uh, our landscape is able to capture that beneficial rain, and it doesn't. It just doesn't end up as runoff. It, it makes no sense to water the night before, and so as a water manager, we want to capture as much as that 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 gift from the skies, if you will, uh, of, of rainfall as we can for for the for the <laughs> landscape. Um, and then and then number, and then number two. Um, if it's if it's a measurable rainfall and it's been a it's been a, a I don't want to say a code but it, it, it's it's part of our you know it's part of our ordinances um, you know yeah again the forty eight hours after measurable rainfall uh, so there we can set the set the set it once it's rained we set the pause for an extra two days if there's something that happens um, I I try to make a point to having rain sensors that also have that automatic forty eight hour setting on there and using rain share. So, uh, you, so that, and that, that, that feature is awesome. You just have that one controller and it shares it to everybody else and, 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 it, and, it, and it trips it. And for 48 hours, I don't have to worry about it if, if I happen to be in a spot where one didn't get the, uh, get the update. Yeah, it's site-wide, right? Yeah. I like that. Awesome. Um, and then the other, the next thing that I see, uh, and you've already spoken about this, and this is something that I see in California, um, predominantly, not so much yet anywhere else, but um, you talked about your real-time ET-based allocation or water budget. Can you yeah. share a little bit about managing to that? Yeah, so so I manage to two budgets. The first, the most, the, the most critical one to our customers is is um, our tiered rate schedule water budgeting. And that, that, that's, it's a simple formula based off of, you know, what ET was, and they give us, again, the, the, a crop factory, either 0.7 or 0.8, if it's potable water or recycled water, and your square footage, um, and you take all that and they divide it down by 748, that's how many units we could use, okay. um, inches per day. I tend to, we tend to not go over those, uh, those budgets are pretty lofty. In my opinion, um, it's it, you can keep uh, warm season turf grass. If it's 100% warm season turf grass, the idea is that you can keep it alive uh, with potable water, and you can keep cool season with with the recycled water alive. Um, if we start mixing in drought tolerant, you know it comes way down. Um, I use a, a water budget that also incorporates beneficial rainfall, which the water agencies don't do, and so I give my my water budgets end up being a little, you know, a little tighter and uh, still, still, you know, keep it within that mark. Um, again, it comes back to reading flows. Um, we have certain agencies that create a budget every week. And if, for those, we have to really keep on top of uh, water flows, whether it's through reading through a flow sensor or doing actual meter readings to make sure that those, um, those uh, sites stay under budget, um, year round without penalty usage. Uh, Absolutely. And that ties into what that next point and final point was. Uh, and, and that is um, adding flow monitoring and flow optimization uh, in, and using that to keep an eye on your water use. You can't manage what you don't measure, right? Absolutely right. If you don't, if you can't see it, you can't monitor it. And if you can't monitor it, you're not, you're going to, you're going to lose out somewhere. You're going to have leaks and, and, Somewhere you're going to have some, some water running down the street and then you're going to get a complaint about it. You're wasting water. And it's like, well, I, I, I didn't know. I, I, I come here I once know. a week. I come here once every two weeks. Uh, if <laughs> it was they, at uh, 3 a.m. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can't see it unless it's reported. And, um, and, and so that's where it, you know, 
we, we are really working hard on getting all of our customers, um, you know, fully online with, with flow. It's very hard to sell on a, on a return on an investment on an ROI, but the, 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 with, with the tightening restrictions it, that you come back to that very phrase, you can't, you can't manage what you can't see. And, and if, 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 if you have one broken head and it leaks for two months before someone finds it on a slope, you know, that's, that could be 400 gallons a day. That's, that's, that's going down the side of a slope and running off to, to nothing. Yep. Absolutely. Flow monitoring is something that I am behind every time I tell all of my sales friends, Hey, uh, I get that it's a ROI decision, right? It's, it, it adds to the purchase price, but the value as a water manager is unprecedented. All right. So um, with yes. those five points in mind, what I want to do is quickly, I'll share my screen again. And what I want to do for the water nerd crowd out there uh, is show you what this looks like on WeatherTrack mobile. So we can go in and just real quickly uh, show you the demo. Come on. Come on. Ready? Go. Just kidding. Technical difficulties. There we go. Bam. All right. So the on those five points that we just talked about, um, I want to walk through what it, what each of those look like on WeatherTrack Mobile. So as the irrigation manager, what is the workflow that you would use while you're out on site to make these changes? Okay. And the first one that we discussed was changing start times and water windows, okay? That is something that is available in the app from the sites level. So if I go into, I first select the controller that I want to manage, and I go to the controllers page, and I go to the settings page on that controllers page, I can see the controller settings for this specific controller. And one thing that we updated last year was we added this program button. And this program button, if I hit this program button, it allows me to see all of the programming elements. And I can go in here, scroll all the way to the bottom, and I can see all eight different programs that this controller uh, is capable of managing. And then if I go in and I select one of these programs, I have the ability to change all of the settings for this. This is how we change both start times and water windows, right? What time we will begin to irrigate, uh, how long we have to irrigate, and finally the water day mode or the allowable days of irrigation. So what uh, Andrew is saying and what we're seeing in California is two days a week. So we would go to days of the week and we would select our two watering days that we're allowed let's just say Monday and Friday, please know, uh, it is important to know that this means that we will start and run any start time and any water window that happens on these days, even if it overlaps into the next day. So if you have an 8 p.m. start time with an eight hour water window, you'll see only half of that on Monday and the other half from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. on Tuesday morning. So um, something to keep in mind as you're adhering to water restrictions. Andrew, anything to build on that? Anything, anything to add? No, it, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I love walking the field with the app and being able to, to make those changes um, as I see them, you know, it, hopefully maybe we can go to three days per week, but yeah, it, uh, one of the biggest, my biggest favorite item, or my biggest favorite, that's really good. My favorite items is actually being able to do the duration also. Um, you know, being able to open up the duration and say, okay, I, I have reduced amount of days to water, but I'm going to open up that duration. You know what? I'm going to start at 8 p.m. I'm going to start at 7 p.m. and let it go till, eight, you know, give it a 13 hour window instead of maybe in the normal eight, you know, so that way I can allow more stations to run within that water window. Absolutely. Going to give it to me. I'm going to take every, every bit I can. <laughs> Amen to that. All right. <laughs> so the next thing we want to talk about is optimizing or changing those station schedules okay for this we go <clears throat> we'll select our controller we'll go uh from the controllers to the stations page and this is where we'll delve into the station programming right we go to the stations page and then the settings page for each individual station we're going to take station one as our example and what we see uh two different 
kinds of changes that are being asked. The one that I have seen um, and I will continue to talk about is a station-based adjustment of the runtime. I wanna save 10% on a station. And you can see right here, the first thing in our auto mode adjustments is this percent adjust, which will give you exactly that, right? It will take the calculated runtime and change it by this percentage. And so um, if I want to turn down a station by 10%, you can just select a 10% adjustment and that will give you 10, a minus 10% of the calculated value. So with WeatherTrack, it's very easy to achieve this type of savings. Uh, you definitely want to talk about the cost with your customer, but the adjustment on the technical side is not very difficult. Is that yeah. fair to say, Andrew? Absolutely. Um, I, I, and that feature is it, we have a lot of slopes and we water top, middle, bottom. And we, when we walk our slopes, if we're seeing that the bottom of the slope is getting a little too, a little more wet than it should be, it's great to be able to just pop in there onto that percent adjust and, 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 and reel it in, you know, go from a zero percent to negative 10, negative 20 easily yeah. uh, on the spot. And you're doing it right there in real time as you're standing there. I mean, the, it's one of the greatest things ever. The other thing that I wanted to touch on, and we won't go too deep on this, but I, other water managers, not Andrew, but other water managers I talk to feel like when you are up against a two-day water restriction, that's really the tipping point of where we can do weather-based irrigation and where the, uh, the restrictions are so extreme that they're no longer the, the best management practice, right? So a lot of folks will say, if I'm down to two days a week, I want it to do what I want it to do exactly every night, right? I don't wanna have that guessing game. And so for that, you can do that with the app by just changing that station mode from auto mode to user mode. And when you do that, notice that the fields that you can change are no longer plant type and sprinkler type, but rather how many minutes per cycle, how many cycles per day, right? And that's station by station. So you can uh, override or go into standalone mode uh, on any one station that you choose to do that with. Yeah, well, and, 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 you know, a lot of times we'll do that with our uh, turf grass areas, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll increase it a little bit more and then allow the drought tolerant. I, I'd rather have weather tracks, the uh, algorithm, figure out the schedule for the drought tolerant because I figure it's going to do way better than me. But as far as the turf grass goes, where it's a little bit more sensitive and we want to make sure that we keep it as green as possible, um, we will throw it in that user ET and then, and make sure that the, the, uh, the ET weekly ET number is, is set right for the month. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely. Right. And if you want to know how to do that, watch our episode on user with ET. There's lots of great tips and tricks in there. Um, and then the last thing that I want to show you in the demo. Uh, oh, wait, the one thing I forgot that is going to be important for all of the future conversations um, is when you switch a station from user mode to auto mode and back again, it's important to understand that WeatherTrack saves that station program. Okay, so uh, when you switch a station from auto mode to user mode to kind of override it for drought conditions, remember that everything that you've done in auto mode is still saved by station. Uh, so it makes big changes that we'll talk about in weeks to come very easy because it all relates back down to that one station programming, right? There's no, uh, it, it doesn't erase or go to a default. Uh, it's saved on both sides. So switching back and forth is uh, fairly easy to do in the software. Okay, and I know I'm out of time. Thank you for sticking with me, sticking late. But the last thing I want to cover is that real-time response to rain conditions, right? We go in, to our controller level commands and we see this pause. Um, and this is a great um, once a <clears throat> snapshot into turning off an irrigation system, a yeah. user defined snapshot. So on the app, we'll be able to see when that rain sensor kicks in and it'll go into pause by itself like Andrew talked about before. Or you can step in as a user either before a rain event or directly after and say, I just want to uh, pause this irrigation. And in our case, we're going to use two days as the example. Know that if I put in two days, I'm talking about two irrigation days, not two calendar days. So our days go from program A start time to program A start time. So you'll see here when you put in that pause, at what point that will expire to make sure that we are in adherence to any local codes and restrictions. 
Uh, anything to add on that, Andrew? No, I mean, it, it, I think you covered all, covered it all really well. Easy peasy mac and cheesy. I'm I'm six minutes over, so I apologize for running long, um, but. Andrew, thank you so much for making time for us this week. Uh, I am going to plug next week's show and then we will bid adieu. Sound fair? Sounds great. All right. So let me just bring this back up. Oh, and we'll go. <clears throat> this drought in the West is going to be a series. This is something that my water managers are going to nerd out about a bit. And so I want to hang out and talk about all of the the topics that are coming along with this. Some that we see uh, in the Muni or in the water district perspective uh, are shocking and things that I, I really think that you should tune in for. So our next session, our week two of, uh, of the new content of Drought in the West series is gonna be uh, featuring, uh, I have to try this again, Maureen Urbeznik, uh, I hope I got that right, <laughs> but um, I'll be co-hosting or Ben Slick will be co-hosting with me. So uh, it'll be the Ben and Ben show back by popular demand. And we will um, have Maureen on to talk about some of the real progressive uh, restrictions that she's seeing and, and kind of see it from the water district point of view. Um, at that point, we'll also talk about how WeatherTrack has the added cloud advantage where we can make huge changes to our portfolio, many stations or many programs all at once. I'll show you the workflow on how to get that done. All right. In the meantime, Andrew, thank you so much for making time. You have any parting thoughts, any water nerd kind of tips and tricks before we call it quits? Oh, in this time, it, during this time, I'm thankful for OptiFlow. That's all I can say. Being able to run 15 drip zones at a time is, is a great, great feature. So I think everybody should upgrade to OptiFlow at this point. We will add <laughs> OptiFlow as a conversation for drought management. That is a great point. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back with the next edition uh, of Drought in the West. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for running long. <laughs>